Hello, friends. So today is the last day of the year, 2022. So I'm doing this last recording this year. So the topic is plasma pheresis or therapeutic pheresis. So very important topic for all the trainees. Uh, so I wish to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Lakshman, who helped me develop this content. So plasma pheresis, I'm sure many of you would have heard of this. So it is a little similar to dialysis where there is blood drawn and it is passed through the plasma separator. So as the name sounds, this separates uh, plasma from the red blood cells. Uh, so the abnormal cells and substances that are intended to be removed is removed. And because the plasma is purified or the substances or certain contents are removed, there has to be replacement fluid that needs to be given. And that replacement fluids could be plasma, could be albumin, or could be crystalloids or colloids. And replacement fluids sometimes can also consist of certain cells and plasma constituents that are meant to be replenished, which are removed. So this is the concept. So as you see the pictorially in diagram, that it is similar to dialysis. It is passed through the plasma separator, which separates cells and the plasma and purifies the plasma. And the purified plasma is sent back into the circulation after replenishing with appropriate constituents that needs to be replaced. So again, this is a diagrammatic representation that uh, once the blood is passed, so the cells are separated, plasma is separated. This plasma is passed through the plasma filter, which filters out various constituents. So one of the things that we need to remember as to what are all the constituents that the plasma filter can remove. It's mainly the autoantibodies. There are certain conditions where you have these antibodies which are not uh, needed, which are causing damage to the organs. So these autoantibodies need to be removed and, and this plasma filters helps in removing these autoantibodies. And it can remove immune complexes. So there are a lot of these immune complexes which tends to get activated, which causes deleterious problems. So it helps in removing the immune complexes or it also helps in removing cryoglobulins, which are the big sort of a protein complexes, uh, especially in multiple myeloma and so on and so forth. Or it can remove the plasma cells as in multiple uh, myeloma or plasma cytomas and so on and so forth. And it can remove the uh, cholesterol containing lipoproteins and plasma pheresis sometimes has been used in hypertriglyceridemia causing pancreatitis where excess triglycerides has to be removed and it, it can be helpful in that also. And as I said, once the plasma is separated from the blood and purified, replacement fluid has to be given and this replenishment ha can happen with allogenic plasma so or a fresh frozen plasma as you would commonly call. It has to be replaced or it can be replaced with colloids and crystalloids and we will look into it as to which are the conditions where only plasma has to be used as a replacement fluid and other conditions where these colloids and crystalloids and what is the proportion of this that needs to be replenished we will look into it. So as I said the plasma exchange or plasma pheresis or therapeutic apheresis it also helps in unloading the reticuloendothelial system. So this is a pictorial representation of the reticuloendothelial system, which has lymphoid follicles and the sinuses in the spleen. And by doing this, it helps in removing the toxins from the system. And it helps to uh, produce activated clones of the lymphocytes, and which is also beneficial in certain autoimmune conditions. So, so these are some of the other benefits of doing plasma exchange. It removes toxins. And then it causes activated pool or the clones of the lymphocytes. So, so for this, there are certain recommended indications for plasma pheresis or plasma exchange or therapeutic apheresis. So it, these words or nomenclatures are interchangeably used. So there is first line conditions in conditions where plasma exchange or therapeutic apheresis is used as a first line treatment. Uh, as a sole treatment or it can be an adjunct to ongoing therapies. So thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So this condition I'm sure many of you would have heard where cystocytes are found and uh, activated by the von Willebrand factor. So this is a condition where it's a prothrombotic state where uh, plasma exchange or therapeutic apheresis is the first line of treatment for this. And this is a proven to be beneficial in thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. 
and it can be first line in guillain barre syndrome or acute inflammatory demanding polyneuropathy or certain types of chronic inflammatory demanding polyneuropathy as you see pictorially there is a lot of this uh, demyelination that happens around the nerve fibers and good pasture syndrome i'm sure many of you would have heard about this uh, condition where uh, anca gets positive predominantly affects the lung and the kidneys where there are immune complexes formed against the uh, glomerular basement membrane of the kidney so anti gbm uh, antibodies so good pasture syndrome is also one of the important condition where plasma therapies can be used as a first line therapy or autoimmune hemolytic anemia so where hemolysis happens so this is also a condition where uh, plasma therapies can be used as a first line and myasthenia gravis i'm sure many of you would have uh, used plasma therapies in myasthenia gravis so where you have antibodies against the ach receptors so this is also a condition where plasma therapies is used as a first line so those are some of the conditions just i put it pictorially for all the trainees to remember so these are the conditions which uh, where plasma therapies is considered as a first line so there are certain conditions where plasma therapies is used as a second line so catastrophic apla where it's a prothrombotic state where arterial and venous thrombi are formed plasma therapies is considered as a second line or multiple sclerosis or eaton lambert syndrome and vasculitis due to any severe autoimmune conditions or hemolytic uremic syndrome sle and some of the mushroom poisonings and multiple myeloma associated nephropathy so these are some of the conditions where plasma therapies is considered as a second line or even in pregnancy where there is rbc allo immunization in pregnancy it is considered as a, this could be considered as a second line so this is just again a pictorial representation of the conditions where plasma therapies is used as a second line so there are conditions where plasma therapies is used but it is less established so thyroid crisis thyrotoxicosis or thyroid crisis is a situation where plasma therapies is contemplated or some of the dermatological conditions like pemphigus vulgaris or pyoderma gangrenosum plasma therapies has been considered but there are anecdotal reports so this is not class 1 or uh, this is not a strong recommendation or a suggestion in any of these condition so now we'll move to the important aspect of uh, the exchange volume so generally in plasma therapies the replenishment of the fluid and the removal of plasma should be one time the whole of plasma volume or 1 to 1.5 times the plasma volume so and it is shown that the single plasma exchange so the whole of plasma the single plasma if it is removed it is shown to lower macromolecules by 60% if we do 1.4 times 1.4 to 5 times removal of the plasma volume Uh, it is shown to reduce the macromolecules by 70%. So the whole plasma therapies, the concept is we take out the single single exchange where the whole of plasma is taken out and replenished by the whole body plasma, or one time or 1.5 times is what is recommended. And this is a very important formula for possibly all trainees to remember as to how do we calculate the plasma volume in an individual. So there is a formula. So the estimated plasma volume in liters is 0.07. into body weight into 1 minus hematocrit so very easy formula to remember only number you need to remember is 0.07 if you remember that so if you extrapolate this formula to 80 kilos individual with a hematocrit of around 35 the estimated plasma volume comes to around 3 to 3.3 liters so it's a very easy formula to so so this formula will tell you what is the plasma volume in an individual and what is that ex when we take one exchange that whole of plasma has to be removed and replenished with the replacement fluid so that's what it means so we have looked at the first line recommendations second line recommendations and less established so there is very interestingly there is an Amer american society for apheresis aspa so aspa has come out with a sort of a guideline as to category 1 recommendation category 2 so very similar category 1 is first line treatment which we saw where it clearly says in thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or guillain barre syndrome or aidp it is first line and sickle cell disease or a complicated sickle cell where sickle cell catastrophe or sickle cell crisis where they have a uh, stroke or any other vascular event this could be considered plasma therapies or exchange could be considered as a first line 
And as per recommends category two, which is the second line treatment for autoimmune hemolytic anemia, myasthenia gravis comes under category two because the first time I mentioned it comes as a first line. But as per as per myasthenia, it is considered a second line or eaton lambert syndrome. And the category three is where decision making has to be uh, sort of individualized by the clinician. And uh, category three, they have put as hypertriglyceridemic uh, hyper uh, pancreatitis uh, or cholesterol induced pancreatitis. Triglyceridemia pancreatitis is a class three, or there's a condition called nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, where uh, because of uh, in chronic kidney disease, who have been exposed to gadolinium, they can have fibrosis of the skin and multiple organs, which is coined as nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, where plasma paresis is contemplated to be beneficial. And as far recommends category four is a conditions where plasma paresis may be ineffective or even may be harmful. And one of the condition is active rheumatoid arthritis. So where possibly one should exercise caution if you're using plasma paresis. So this is as per American Society for Apheresis guidelines. So now we'll talk about replacement fluid because this is most important. So we saw when we say one plasma exchange, you need to calculate the plasma volume for an individual, which is 0 0.07 into body weight into one minus hematocrit, which gives you plasma volume. And one plasma exchange is the removing the whole of plasma 1.5. So once we remove that, we have to replace it with the replacement fluid. And replacement fluid most commonly that is used is plasma. And there are conditions where only plasma has to be used. We cannot use colloid or crystalloid. And there are certain conditions which, uh, so especially TTP, only plasma has to be used. Or you can use albumin. Or you can use colloids or crystalloids. Or it is combination of albumin and colloids or crystalloids. So plasma only has to be used in condition, especially TTP, which is category one recommendation or level one or, or the first level recommendation, first line treatment, here the replacement fluid has to be only plasma. TTP is one condition where only plasma has to be used. But in all other conditions, possibly albumin and combination of albumin with crystalloid or colloid has, could be used. And when we are using albumin, again, very important for trainees, it has to be only 5% albumin. Even if it is 20%, if it is only because right now we have 5% albumin available in India, which we can use it. Even if it is not available, 20% has to be reconstituted into 5% and has to be used as 5% albumin. And it is even said 20% should not be used as a solo. So it has to be used as 5% albumin. And if you are using combination of albumin with a crystalloid, the colloid component should not be less than 50%. It should be more than 50%. So it has to be 1 is to 1 or 2 is to 1 sort of a ratio. Suppose the example, if you, the albumin replenishment fluid is 3 liters, 1.5 liters has to be used as albumin and the rest 1.5 liters volume is not by 1.5 liters saline, you have to use 3 liters saline, which is equal to 1.5 liters of the plasma replenishment that we have to use. Although I have written 1.5, it is 3 liters of saline that we need to use which equates to 1.5 liters of the plasma volume. So that's our understanding. So it has to be in combination with colloid and crystalloids and colloids has to be more. It has to be more than 50%. If you remember that, that's good enough. And 5% albumin to be used and not 20% is something which, which is important for trainees to keep in their mind. And what is the apheresis schedule? As I said, one exchange every two to three days, which means you calculate what is the plasma volume that needs to be exchanged. And every two to three days, one exchange could be done. Sometimes if it is in a severe TTP, we have even done one exchange every day. And it is to be one to 1.5 plasma volume, which I mentioned. So one plasma volume you can calculate. It, it can be one or what up to 1.5 plasma volume exchange that you can do. And total of three to five procedures may be needed for any of these conditions. And for severe conditions like TTP or good pasture syndrome, it is such a, it, uh, many a times every day plasma pheresis or therapeutic apheresis may have to be done. And it is shown that it removes 75 to 80% of fibrinogen. That's why it's important we keep monitoring fibrinogen and removes complement and removes immune complexes. And IgG 65% is removed in this apheresis. And apheresis is shown to be less effective in removal of electrolytes, factor 8 and uric acid. Uh, so it is not very effective in removing these components. 
So what are the complications of therapeutic apheresis? Uh, so vascular complications because you would possibly put a uh, dialysis catheter of some sort to do this exchange. Uh, so they can have all the vascular complications, vascular injury, thrombosis, and hematoma, so on and so forth. Infections are common because you are uh, replenishing the blood products with the plasma and the blood products, so and the byproducts of blood. So this leads to increased risk of infection. And uh, because it is like any other extracorporeal, so there can be hemodynamic stability, hypotension. When you are using citrate as an anticoagulant, it can lead to hypocalcemia and hypolemia. Arrhythmias are common. So we have seen in patients who are undergoing plasma paresis, we have seen hemodynamic compromise, patients having arrhythmias and uh, severe uh, decompensation of the hemodynamic status and it is it can lead to vascular thrombosis and the dreaded complication is trolley because you are replenishing up to two to three liters of blood products with plasma especially in a condition like ttp they can develop uh, transcription related acute lung injury which is a dreaded complications and sometimes we can have anaphylaxis even we have seen anaphylaxis when patients undergoing plasma exchange so these are some of the uh, run of the mill complications that you would see in any of the extracorporeal, more so when there are a lot of blood products involved with regards to replenishing your uh, plasma. So, you would expect any of these complications. So, now very quickly we'll talk about is there evidence of uh, therapeutic apheresis or plasma pheresis in acute liver failure? So, it is called high volume plasma pheresis. In liver failure, this concept has evolved over the course of time. So, there, and the terminology we use is high volume plasma paresis. It is shown to remove cytokines or damage associated molecular proteins and ammonia. So, high volume plasma paresis has been shown to be beneficial in removing uh, these toxins and takes on the function of the liver. And it is shown to replenish coagulation factors because you are giving so much of plasma as the replenishing factors. So, there are three important studies. So, this is one large study which came from Scandinavian country. It was done in Denmark, Finland, and UK, where they have compared high volume plasma pheresis with standard medical therapy. And it is shown that high volume plasma pheresis was shown to have a significant, significant benefit in 30 day transplant free survival, was shown to be better with uh, high volume plasma pheresis. And high volume plasma pheresis was shown to reduce the liver enzymes, reduce the INR, reduce the amine, ammonia, and reduce the bilirubin. So, this was one big study compared with the standard medical therapy. High volume plasma paresis showed some survival benefit. After this, uh, and here, if you look at, they have used 8 to 12 liters per day of FFP as a replenishment at 1 to 2 liters per hour for 3 days. So, very high volume of plasma exchange has been done in this particular study, up to 8 to 12 liters. So, which possibly amounts to... Uh, two to three exchanges, two to three plasma exchanges. Because if I consider three liters for 80 kgs, so if you are talking about 12, so you are really talking about three exchanges per day and replenishing it with a, uh, with a heavy load of plasma uh, with the one to two liters per hour. And after this, there was this meta-analysis that came from China, which uh, basically they did not have a big randomized control trial. So this meta-analysis, uh, the conclusions they made was they were unable to recommend high volume plasma paresis as a standard of care in the liver failure. So here they compared three days high volume plasma paresis versus low volume plasma paresis on alternate days. And they did not find a sort of any major impact on the survival or any of the endpoints. So this was another study which came from uh, Poland and Hungary where they looked at all the modalities that are available like high volume plasma paresis, MARS, biologic BT, charcoal hemoperfusion or bioactive liver assist therapy. So these are all different therapies for the liver support in acute liver failure. And what they found in this particular study, which is the latest, which came in 2021, they showed it was only high volume plasma pheresis and MARS, which had mortality benefit in acute liver failure. And I'm sure many of listeners would know in acute liver failure, high volume plasma pheresis will possibly act as a bridge prior to transplant, but definitely Definitive therapy would be a liver transplant in acute liver failure. So, so I think that's the uh, whole concept about plasma paresis. So, to summarize, I think uh, we understand that plasma paresis is basically separating the plasma out of the blood and purifying its contents and replacing with 
uh, fluids, which may be plasma, colloids, or crystalloids. And the level one recommendations, please remember, it will be TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. It will be acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, which is uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Or in some time in the hemolytic anemia on SLE and sometimes in um, any of these APLA. So the grade two would be APLA and uh, and few other conditions like nephrogenic pulmonary fibrosis and so on and so forth. But I think the level one is what we would have been commonly exposed to, which is... Uh, TTP and uh, myasthenia gravis and AIDP. So these are the conditions which possibly as intense as we would have been exposed to. And complications, uh, as I said, would be infection or anything to do with uh, blood products. Trali is a dreaded complication. And very briefly, we spoke about evidence in acute liver failure, where uh, at this point of time, high volume plasmapheresis seems to be having some role. So thank you very much. So I wish to... Uh, Wish everyone, uh, all the listeners here, a happy new year for 2023. So thank you one and all. So end with this beautiful quote. If there's a path at all, it's emptying yourself of what you are not. Thank you, friends.